welcome to Healthcare Triage Live. We're having some real internet problems here. I assume you're seeing this, so it's working on the hard line, but the Wi-Fi is so slow. It's killing me, it really is. Anyway, thank you for joining us. Um, this is usually when I would talk about some of the housekeeping information we usually do, like go see our Facebook page, facebook.com slash healthcare triage, but we're actually gonna spend another minute talking about something interesting. It's like, cause I learned something this week, maybe you'll learn it with me. So, you know, one of the ways that healthcare triage supports itself is through ad revenue. We get a tiny amount of money when you watch the ads that are attached to these videos. But it turns out that for years, YouTube was uh, making a list of ads they deemed objectionable. Uh, and not putting any ad revenue on them because companies might find them uh, objectionable. Um, were they still running ads on those videos? So they, they were not running ads on those videos at all. Um, because, you know, if you did a video on like, should marijuana be legal? And then, you know, somebody found that offensive and advertisers get upset. So they just decided some videos, no revenue. The problem was that they never told anyone they were doing this until like, I guess a week or two ago when they sent out mass numbers of emails letting people know what videos have been deemed objectionable for the last like three years. Um, it turns out like any video with the word drug in its title is objectionable. And as you can imagine, there's many healthcare triage episodes that have the word drug in them, but more often than not to talk about legitimate drug use. Our cough and colds myth episode was deemed objectionable. I can't even figure out why. And that was prop. And that was a nice popular video that might have actually made some revenue with which we could actually keep the lights on and keep making healthcare triage. So now we can appeal some of these, but it turns out it hurt. And it hurt not just uh, healthcare triage, but lots of videos in the whole DFTBA eco geek family. So. It's always a message for like, we appreciate your support on Patreon.com, which of course doesn't find us objectionable. Doesn't censor us in any way. Um, so, you know, if you ever think about, you might wanna, you know, support us, even if it's like a dollar. We'll take anything, because it helps to king in, keep all of this going. The electrons cost money. Uh, Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. We really, really, really do appreciate your support. It goes to healthcare triage and making all these great videos. Thank you. All right, let us begin. N Kicker asks, yesterday an article in the Annals of Internal Medicine found that for every hour with patients, doctors spend two hours with the HRs, plus one to two hours at home with the HRs. Is this news or is this already known? It's not news to doctors that use EHRs, but it might be news to you. Um, and so I feel like we've done an episode on EHRs, but if not, I've certainly done podcasts and I've done tons of blog posts about them. And you know, most of my research is in information technology and clinical decision support and the use of EHRs. And this is not surprising at all to people that study them or people that use them. They are not nearly as efficient as people would like to believe they are or as you know, salesmen say that they are. And so it isn't surprising to me it isn't news to me, it isn't news to people that use EHSRs that doctors spend an enormous amount of time with them more than they do with patients. When I, I will check the, I have clinic tomorrow morning, I'll check the EHR tonight and I will spend time looking at the lists and just checking to see, because I don't know the patients. You know, see, and I'll look at their records and everything else. And then tomorrow I will log in and I will stare at it and I will try to figure out how to get to all the things I want to do. And I'll see the patient, then I'll have to run through the questions and then I'll have to document what I did. And then I'll have to figure out how to order the consults and how to order the drugs and I have to keep running up and back and check with the nurses about the vaccine. And it's a pain in the butt. And the stories I could tell you about the EHR and just how ridiculously inefficient it is and how it doesn't follow like the rules of programming 101 um, in the way that it sets things up. So it's terrible. So I'm not going to mention the company name, but no, not surprising at all. Will it get fixed? No, not anytime soon. Liz Barino, you said you reserve judgment on parents who spank, but how do you know when they've crossed into problematic uses? It's like the Supreme Court said about pornography, you know, when you see it. Um, I... You have to make judgment calls. You just do. In the same way that I suppose that, like, you know, the police have to make judgment calls about, you know, what is assault and what is not. And, you know, Child Protective Services has to make uh, judgments on what is abuse or neglect or not. You know, physicians have to make abuses on what is wrong or not. Um, and so we live in a society that is still somewhat accepting of spanking. 
People will claim we don't live in such a society, but we do. Um, and I live in a state where a significant number of people still spank their children. I have friends who spank their children. I have good friends who spank their children. And to be honest with you, I've seen, you know, they're sort of, and it's like, and I can see that they are using it in a manner which has strict rules and which is used very tightly. And it's like, I get it. And it might not be what I choose to do, but I do not judge it. And the way that I don't judge lots of stuff that I see amongst people I disagree with. Um, and so how do I know? You, you sort of know when it's like getting out of line, when it's really more about pain than it is about, you know, shock. Um, when it's, you know, not even about discipline anymore or just because of like people are angry or it's like it becomes where it's not, you know, there, there are ways. And I, I wish I had like a five-step rule blah, 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 to do it, but such a thing does not exist. And clearly this is one where some people feel about it one way and other people feel about another and third parties will feel about it a third way and we do not have strict guidelines on this and so you make your judgments. I wish I had a better answer for you. Abizi says, in Ontario guidelines say women don't need paps until they've had sexual skin to skin contact. Elsewhere I've heard it by age 21 even though sexual history. What does the evidence say? Yeah, you know, less more and more the evidence is saying that pap smear should be directed to people who are at high risk. So. You know, it depends on which guidelines you use. And it's not because in Ontario, it's, it's not because you're in Canada that it's unclear. It's because, you know, even in the United States, it's like guidelines keep shifting and moving. And so it depends which guidelines you trust. If you go by the USPSTF, there might be one. If you go by American College of, of Gynecology, there might be another. If you go to by universal, you know, international organizations, there might be another. If you go by Canada, by England, by the UK, it's all going to be different. Um, these days, we are getting to the point where we're actually doing fewer and fewer pap smears, um, especially because if we could really promote the HPV vaccine, we'd probably reduce the risk of cervical cancer and we, we would make it even less and less likely that people would need um, pap smears unless they were at significantly high risk. So the, the, the problem is not that you're in Ontario. The problem is not about the evidence. The problem is about how people are reading the evidence and the fact that there are multiple guidelines at this point and they likely conflict. Little Lion Flower. Hi, Dr. C. Was wondering about the tissue paper seat covers in public bathrooms. What are they trying to protect me from? An STI, norovirus, can they possibly be effective? So, you know, to some extent, oh crap, I just answered the phone, I didn't mean to. Um, to some extent, they, okay, they're not usually protecting against an STI. You don't catch HIV, for instance, from a toilet seat. Most things are gonna die before they, you know, they don't live on a toilet seat, so you're not worried about that. I would say probably what you're worried about most is just people's theoretically, you know, theoretical cleanliness. Um, like you wouldn't want to sit on someone else's pee or poop. At least most people would not want to sit on someone else's pee or poop. Um, they're not, can they possibly be effective? I don't know that I've seen randomized controlled trials. I bet that they're more, they're more for people's comfort than they are for proven, uh, you know, disease prevention. Um, Cause clearly if, if like, you know, if you, no, I have a hard time agreeing with you, imagining it's purely for disease prevention. It's probably more for, you know, comfort. It is probably more for peace of mind. It is probably more about, you know, cleanliness than it is about, you know, preventing infection. Because of course, unless you have like an open wound, it is very unlikely that anything could even get there. And, you know, if you've got virus on your butt, unless you later touched your butt and put it into your mouth, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, you know, you wouldn't be able to still get it from your butt to your mouth. So, you know, if it was oral, tr orally transmitted, it's not really going to matter for the most part unless you're, you're sort of not doing things safely in your own way. So they're probably overkill. And of course, if you find research that says otherwise, if you actually know of a study, please do let me know. I would be fascinated by such a thing. So please, 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 please let me know. Next, N. Kicker asks, the rise in superbugs has triggered a meeting of the UN General Assembly. What, if anything, do you think will happen at this meeting? I would imagine very little. Uh, the UN General Assembly has trouble getting together to agree on most things. Um, what would they do about superbugs? Um, we probably already have like, you know, white papers saying what we wish people would do in terms of preventing resistance and everything else, but we've already sort of said those things and we have trouble getting people even in like the United States or local countries to do it. We worry about f antibiotic feed in animals. It's very hard to restrict that. We worry about the overuse of antibiotics. We've made many videos on that. People still go after them for colds. Doctors still overprescribe them. People still demand them. So the things that we would do, we know about. 
We just don't do them. And if the UN General Assembly gets together and says, hey, we probably shouldn't be indiscriminately using antibiotic feed in feed. We probably shouldn't be you know, over-prescribing antibiotics or using them for, for viruses. Yes. Did you not know that? They're not going to start putting people in jail. They're not going to start put, coming out with like sticks and carrots to try to get people to not do this stuff because they can't even do that within each other's countries. The idea that the UN is going to dictate that kind of stuff. So I get pessimistic. Unless they sort of orchestrated a treaty that was going to put massive amounts of money into changing things. But we, you know, we try to do this stuff in the United States already. It's not like we, it's just, it's not like the UN will convince us to do more in this area. It's an area where we already know it's a problem and we just often lack the will to do anything about it. Crunch, crunch, crunchy. I have a small patch of ringworm on my leg and my mother insists I use essential oils for it. I think iodine would work better and it's proven to work. How do I tell her essential oils are snake oil? Well, why iodine? I mean, ringworm is, an, is a fungal infection. I would probably use like, you know, an antifungal. And I'm not talking like, go, don't, don't have to take anything massive. It's like Lotrimin cream or something like that. So um, I, would some, I would say to your mom, essential oils are unproven, but I'm not sure about the iodine either. Um, why iodine? Maybe it is proven. I, I don't even know. I've never seen that actually or heard about being used. Do I believe that might work better than essential oil? Sure. Do I think that iodine is better than actual medications that we have that we know treat ringworm effectively? No. So I, I guess if we put it on a scale, I think you're doing better than your mother. But I'd also be like, why, why not use Lotrimin? Again, we're not talking about a massive oral antibiotic or something like that that's going to change your system. It's a local topical thing that you could use that has been proven to work. Do that. One decade later, one decade later. See, sometimes it's hard to read these names. On a personal level, what's your reaction when people respond to your publications by calling you an industry shill? Which topics get the most of these reactions? So this happens more often than you would think, and it always makes me laugh um, because my writings about most industries are not the things that the industries would promote. For, in promote. for instance, like probably the thing I was most famous for at the beginning of my career was like I wrote papers that supported um, – that showed that more physicians supported national health insurance that promoted it. Um, and I'd spoken quite a bit about single-payer health care. And yet, it is amazing to me how many people now today call me like a shell for the insurance industry because like I think the Affordable Care Act is better than nothing. And I'm always sort of like, really? Because the insurance industry, they don't like me very much. I've written a number of pieces, even in the New York Times, talking about that I think that the numbers the pharmaceutical industry often uses to talk about how expensive it is to make a drug and therefore why they have to charge so much for them are overinflated. I've attacked that quite publicly, which does not make me beloved in the pharmaceutical industry. And yet there are people who will say I'm a pharmaceutical industry hack, which also blows me away. Um, more recently, it's uh, it's been about nutrition because I've written a number of articles, you know, saying like that I think the evidence against salt uh, is, is somewhat overblown. And then people say, like, I'm in the pocket of big salt. I'm like, what's big salt? Morton's? Like, what, what, who's making money on salt? Like, I don't even know. And they'll say I'm in the pocket of the beef industry. And I'm like, I don't even know how that would play out. And the one that gets me the most is that uh, is I, I'm not totally against artificial sweeteners. And I'm, I think sugar is pretty bad for us. And I've written pieces saying I think that the evidence and the, the anger against artificial sweeteners is somewhat overblown. And my God, people lost their minds on that and attacked me. It, there was an organization that actually like um, uh, took all my emails um, because I work for a public institution. I don't know though it's Freedom of Information Act or if it's whatever public laws. And like they, I mean, they, people have like gotten really angry and tried to go after me. And of course, they took all my emails and they found, I'm assuming, since I've never heard from them again or seen anything, no evidence of me being in bed with food industry and anything else because. I'm not in bed with the food industry. Like I, I don't get money from them. Um, I have no relationship with them. I've never spoken, as far as I know, to Monsanto or uh, PepsiCo or any of those other industries. And I have certainly no grants of them and I've given no talks to them and I have no relationship with them or anything else. So I don't know. It bothers me 
it bothers me because I feel like it's a knee-jerk reaction way to dismiss what I'm trying to do. It bothers me because I think it pigeonholes me and talks about conflicts of interest. It bothers me on a philosophical level because I think we spend an enormous amount of time focusing on financial conflicts of interest and none on you know, ideological conflicts of interest. Like, I'd be much more concerned about me um, not reporting to you stuff that I disagree with because of inherent subjective philosophical or ideological beliefs than I would be about the money. I don't have any money, but you should be worried. That was just why, for instance, when we talked about, when I did the video on circumcision, I felt it important to say, look, I want to acknowledge I'm Jewish. It has a cultural, you know, importance for me and my children are circumcised and my family's also like, I want you to know that so that you can judge that I'm acknowledging out loud my prior potential conflicts so that you know that I've acknowledged them, you can acknowledge them, and then we can debate the science. If I didn't say those things, then you'd be like, well, he's, why is he hiding that? And I've acknowledged in the past too other issues where it's like, look, I acknowledge my philosophical beliefs, you know, or my ideological beliefs so that we can have them out in the open so that we can, you know, have them in the light of day so that then we can therefore discuss the research. And I think that sometimes people just need to go like, boom, I, you know, he's conflicted. Like I've seen people be like, uh, you know, if they see something published by or that is supported by the food industry, they will immediately reject it. But if they see something, you know, supported by the organic food industry, well, that's okay. And I'm like, well, there, come on. Then you have an ideological conflict of interest. Either you have to be against the industry supporting it or, or for them. You can't just knee-jerk, re, you know, reject all this but support all this because this group you like. People do that all the time. So on a personal level, I roll my eyes at it and I'm annoyed by it, but I've learned to let it go. Um, because people who want to reject things just because they want to reject things will find a reason. Um, whether it be because they think I'm in the pocket of big Salt, whatever it was. I, I remember once somebody actually argued that I was uh, in the um, that I was against something because like I was just you know I was I was against hurting poor people and I was like yes I'm in the pocket of big poor. Like like I don't know. Um, so yes you know it bothers me but what are you gonna do? Lady Legacies is there a difference between ionized water, alkaline water, and distilled water? Well, there's probably a difference, but not really a health difference, which is what you're getting at. So, can I put the three side by side and tell you what the differences are? Sure. Is there any health difference between the three? None that is proven, and that is what we really care about. Maddie 147, should we really follow FDA instructions and wash our hands for 20 seconds? I do, and everyone laughs at me. Well, in this case, they should not be laughing at you. So, you know, hand washing, proper hand washing is probably one of the best, uh, you know, public health prevention things we can do to not get sick. Another one is not to put our hands on our faces. And I, multiple times during this, I keep doing it. It's like, it's a habit while I'm doing these shows. My hands are right here because I can't keep them down here and I don't know. Um, but yes, keeping your hands clean, especially when you're going to use them to eat, not touching your face, some of the best you know, sickness prevention things you can do. And when we do the studies of hand washing, it turns out that, as we've talked about in episodes, antibacterial soap is garbage, and the FDA is finally getting around to getting rid of that stuff. Soap is, ironically enough, not the most important part of hand washing. What is, is the vigorous scrubbing, the rubbing under water. That's what gets most of the stuff off. And doing it for enough time to get the stuff off is important. Um, you know, just doesn't do anything. It's the rubbing. It's this. It's like the physical activity of it is actually quite important. And 20 seconds, some people argue, is not even enough. But 20 seconds is probably good. So yes, you probably should. Using soap is fine. Probably good. You know, it does help with some stuff. And you know, vigorously rubbing it underwater for 20 seconds. Yes, yes, yes. These are all good things to do. So in this case, yes, you probably should. If everyone's laughing at you, I don't know. Sucks to be them. You know, ignore that. In the same way, everybody, I ignore it when they call me an industry show. Ah, Mama Fish. What do you know about migraines and CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide? What natural purpose does the CGRP serve and why would it be elevated during migraines? I know nothing about this. I know nothing about this whatsoever, so I'd have to look into it. I don't know if this is garbage 
I don't know if this is like something they're trying to sell you a product with or if this is actually legitimate research that it's just probably in its early stages and I just don't know how much it's going to bear out. I would guess it's the third one. Um, and so maybe this will bear out and maybe this can be used, therefore, to target you know something in the future and build a new drug that will actually relieve migraines better or more effectively. Maybe, but I don't think we're there yet because if, if it was there like mainstream we're doing with drugs, I think I'd have heard about it and I have not. Bader 606, is five small meals instead of three meals actually healthier? What's healthier? You know, what does that even mean? If that helps you to eat more healthily, I'm all for it. It is not something that is proven, however, to work generally for everybody. Now, I won't say that three meals is all, three meals a day is a social construct. Left in the animals in the wild, they don't eat three meals a day. We are likely, as we evolved, did not eat three meals a day. The breakfast, lunch, and dinner thing is is what we made. You know, is maybe the hobbits have it better with second breakfast and second, I don't know. Um, maybe that's what they did back in Middle Earth. Um, but um, I don't, I don't know. So when you use the word healthier, that's when I'm like, I'm like, I, we don't even know what's healthy for everybody in nutrition with the three meals a day is buy small meals better. If it helps you to eat better, great. But I wouldn't necessarily push either way on anybody. You should do what works best for you. Tiva Box, does being a frequent flyer affect tell, such as flying around for business in various countries? Oh, well, maybe? Okay, so there's a number of ways this can come into play. If you fly a massive amount, you're worried about cosmic radiation. There is evidence, of course, you're exposed to more cosmic radiation, but we've really not shown that that actually affects health in any way that people should be overly concerned about because they do this research even in like, you know, pilots and, and flight attendants and they don't know that, notice that much of a difference. If you're worried about the air circulation, there's actually better air circulation in airplanes than there are on, uh, you know, many office buildings and everything else. I would not necessarily be concerned about that. If you're worried about being forced to sit next to someone who could be sick, and that's a small contained period of time for many, many hours, yes, that could be a problem. Not much you can do about that. If you're worried about the fact that probably those tray tables are filthy and people might have gone, you don't know. Baby could have barfed on it. You have no idea. Um, so in that case, yes, you're, you're exposing yourself to tons of people touching tons of things in close, close proximity. But again, good hand washing. Don't put your hands in your face. Don't, you know, don't touch your food. You know, you can avoid most of those things. If you're worried about the fact that you're traveling to countries that have other illnesses that, you know, might be problematic that you're not immunized to, well, of course, it depends where you're traveling and you got to look that up on the CDC websites and try to figure that out. And finally, if you're just worried about, you know, it's changing time zones, making me more sleepy, making me more susceptible, a bit, but not that I would be concerned about. So there's nothing huge other than continue to do the things you would otherwise normally do, like proper hand washing and don't touch stuff and then touch your mouth. Don't touch stuff and then touch foods. You know, don't let people sneeze on you or cough on you. Those are all common sense things that'll serve you well as you are freaking fired, just as if you're in the, you know, in your home country. Last question of the day, Rachel Gooden, do you think medical... Do you think medical errors, oh my God, you're, do you think medical errors, do we do this video yet? Do we, do we, is this video out yet? Okay. Do we think medical errors, maybe the third leading cause, cause of death, will ever be reduced to the point where the medical industry with high reliability like the airline industry? So many things here. One, medical errors, it's very popular to say medical errors are the third leading cause of death, but I wrote a piece for the New York Times a couple weeks ago that took that claim to task. We've all, we've adapted it to a healthcare triage episode, which will be up soon and you should watch. That is very questionable, okay? It's, it's a number that makes a lot of press. But saying that one in three hospital deaths is caused by medical error doesn't really even pass the smell test. And there's a lot of reasons why that is not necessarily true. We've already filmed the episode. You will see it soon. soon. Secondly, it turns out that the airline industry's much vaunted, you know, error prevention stuff isn't as great as people think it is. Of course, because they only ever focus on the crash and crashes are very rare. Um, and when a crash happens, it's like that is everybody knows and it's like that's, it's a never event. Deaths in hospitals are not never events. They do occur all the time. Um, and to say that like we should say an airline crash should never happen, but it's like a hospital death is going to happen and deaths are going to happen. So, you know, trying to compare those apple to apple 
doesn't work, except, of course, in articles that want to brag about the fact that other industries are better than the medical industry. Does this mean that the medical industry couldn't improve itself with respect to harm prevention and the fact that medical errors are a real issue? Of course. Like, those things are totally true. But, you know, trying to expect that medical errors or the deaths that possibly could be due to medical error go to zero is a very unrealistic expectation. But we do expect that of the airline industry. Um, and so all of this is questionable. Go watch that episode when it comes out, then come back and let's have a further discussion. Thank you for watching Healthcare Triage, Healthcare Triage Live, Healthcare Triage News. This Friday's episode is going to be a news update on EpiPens, which is what we filmed on Monday, or what we, I'm sorry, put out on Tuesday, actually, because it was a holiday this week. So go watch the episode on EpiPens, then watch Healthcare Triage News on Friday for an update, up to the minute, on what's going on with EpiPens. Um, we'll be here next week for Healthcare Triage News. Please consider supporting us on patriot.com slash healthcare triage in case YouTube tries to, you know, say that even more stuff that healthcare triage does can't make money because we mentioned the word, I mentioned the word drugs today, so we probably won't be able to do anything with this. So, you know, thanks for your support. We really appreciate it. Hope we'll see you next week.